Welcome to the Princeton Festival podcast, where we take you behind the scenes of New Jersey's premier performing arts festival. With directors, producers, artists, and supporters, we explore the creative process and the challenges of making music today. Join us on this musical adventure. My name is Eva Kastner-Puschel. I'm the host of this show. In this episode, I'm speaking with stage director Stephen Lacoste. A warm welcome to the show, Stephen. Thank you, Eva. Great to be here. And great speaking with you today. Before we jump into our conversation, I would like to briefly introduce you to our audience. Stephen Lacoste is a renowned stage director and committed educator. To this day, he has directed 105 productions and appeared with many opera companies such as Toledo Opera, Opera Carolina, the Utah Festival Opera Company, to name a few, and the Princeton Festival. To many of our listeners, Stephen Lacoste is a familiar name as he is a regular at the festival. Stephen, our artistic director, Richard Tangyuk, enjoys working with you and praises you for your imagination and creativity, your rehearsal efficiency, your understanding of the bottom line, and for your people skills. When did you first start working with Richard and the company? Well, that would have been in the second year of the festival. So it was, um, it was the first time we did Madame of Butterfly. Um, Richard had called me. Uh, or sent me an email saying he needed to just talk to me about something, but he didn't say what, and I was in the middle of directing another piece, so I thought, he didn't say it was an emergency, I'll wait till next week, and then I'll give him a call, and, and I can catch up, because he didn't say it was like, I have to talk to you right now. Well, unbeknownst to me, the director that he had lined up for Madama Butterfly was not going to be able to be there for the tech part of the rehearsals, and so he was desperately looking for someone to direct, and we had gone to graduate school together at Indiana University, and I had directed a piece that he prepared, uh, Minotti's The Unicorn, The Manticore, and The Gorgon. Um, and I had, uh, with a choreographer, I had staged the singers and made this production out of it. And he had played, actually, for one of the um, pieces that I did in the um, studio opera there called uh, The Telephone. So we knew, we'd known each other a long time, and our paths hadn't crossed, but he needed a stage director, and um, I was free. So I was able to come and do that first Madame Butterfly. And thank God he was persistent in calling me because since he didn't say it was an emergency and I was in the middle of teching another piece, I thought, well, let me get through the tech, which was like the weekend, and then I can, I'll can i call him back because we'll be open and I'll be fine. So That's perfect. Now, you have directed many operas with the festival, and I also read that those are among your career highlights. What makes you come back to the Princeton Festival year after year? Well, the chance to work with Richard, obviously. Uh, and, and the rest of the team, Marie, uh, Greg, uh, and the various people that have been there through, over the years working with the uh, Carter staff has been great. Uh, I think for me, the reason I keep coming back is because it's interesting repertoire. Well, we have done our share of standard repertoire. Certainly, we've done La Boheme, uh, Marriage of Figaro, uh, Madame Butterfly twice. But we have done some very interesting pieces that a lot of places wouldn't take a chance in doing. I mean, the Rake's Progress. Handles Ario Dante, uh, Benjamin Britten's Midsummer Night's Dream, and Peter Grimes, and last year's Nixon in China. So artistically, it's a great place for me to come because it's things that I would not be able to do here in my job at school. We don't have a big enough school to do those kinds of pieces. So it's a chance for me to stretch artistically, and um, and I enjoy coming to Princeton. I enjoy working, you know, where I stay with Anna. Uh, been there since the beginning. I, I like talking to the board members. Um, I, I enjoy the town and my time there. So lots of good things. Stephen, you were set to direct this year's opera La Traviata, but unfortunately this could not be realized due to COVID-19. But let me ask you, what is your approach to a production in general and how do you get from the libretto to the final staging? Okay, so, um, well, let, let me let me share you a little story. Okay, so... Let's, let's take Handel's Ario Dante. Richard asked me about doing a Baroque opera, and I said, you know, Richard, they're so hard, and I'm not sure I can, I don't know that I would bring anything to it. I don't know that I would do it well enough, as well as I do other pieces, but let me read, let me study it, and let me get back to you as to whether I think I can do it or not. So in Ario Dante's case, I got a libretto, 
I read it. I put it down for a week. I read it again. This is how I do most every opera. I read the libretto and I get first impressions. I make some notes. I put it away. I pick it up again. I make some notes. I put it away. And then as I read Ario Dante, I thought, you know, there's a very interesting story here. So I called Richard up and I said, fine, I'll do it. So now I'm going to do it. So the next thing I have to do is, okay, so what I do is I, I just basically, I pull the piece apart technically. Okay, this is where the opera says these scenes take place. These are the people in the places. These are the clothes I think they should be wearing. If I pick a period, I say, okay, then maybe there needs to be a costume change here. Or it says, or these are the props they're using. If there's, there's a dance in this scene, um, you know, there's a chorus in this scene. And I break it down just very technically, not even thoughts or art about it. Just like, okay, this is what the piece says. It says that Ariodante pulls a dagger. Okay, then I know there has to be a dagger in that scene, and the dagger has to somehow go out of the costume or in the boot or something like that. Okay, so that's just very technical. Then I begin to do historical research on the period that I might want to set it in. I begin to look at costumes and characters. I rarely, rarely watch a performance of it. If it's a piece I don't know, I actually do not want to watch a performance of it because I don't want to have somebody else's idea get stuck in my head because I'm a very visual person. Mm -hmm. So I don't want something like that to get stuck up there. And then I'm trying to direct to that image that I don't even know why that image was there because I wasn't involved in creating that production. Then, um, because we've been very fortunate to do a lot of new productions, uh, the designer hopefully is doing their part of it. And so I bring in uh, the design team. And usually I do lighting and scenery together. And in this case, I've worked with uh, with Norman Coates, who's been coming for years and does great stuff. I do a lot of work with him here in Winston-Salem at Piedmont Opera. Excellent lighting designer. And then um, Johnny Robertson, who has been a uh, great uh, set designer. He did Peter Grimes. He did Nixon in China. He did Beethoven Sudelio. And so we come together and we, we then we get to talk about what is the piece actually about? What is the point of view we want to take? And not just tell the story, but put a point of view on it. And so we, we argue back and forth. We ask questions. We go away. We come back. And this takes a long time. I mean, Nixon China was two years in the planning, as was Flying Dutchman. Wow. Because you have to really, you know, if you're going to do a piece like that, you want to have time for those ideas to sit. And then maybe new ideas come in or you circle back or something. You know, you want to have time to live with that. So then I talked to cut Marie, the costume designer, and said, okay, like, for the case of La Traviata, I said, well, let, we were, she wanted to do it in the 1920s. And I said, as long as we have the um, physical bodies to wear those costumes, I'm fine with doing it in the 1920s. And we did when Richard cast it. Those, those people would look good in those clothes. Uh, but then I do all that. Then I go back to the libretto. Then we have, um, in the case of a new production, a model, a model is built. And then we get together and we do something called a model tech. Mm-hmm. Where uh, and now this course, this is all run by Richard, and he approves it and approves the budget, and then the tech. You know, there's that whole side of the budgeting part of it. So once we've come down to the point where okay, these are the things we can do, a model is built, and then the lighting designer, the set designer, and I get together and we sit with the model and we go scene to scene. What is each scene going to look like? How, if the scenery moves, how are we going to move from scene to scene? In the case of Nixon in China, we had a lot of projections. You know, mm-hmm. so how are we going to use the projections to help tell the story, not be the predominant figure in it, but to help support the story that's happening on stage? And how does the lighting help that? And if I have a good, if there's a costume or a prop idea, like in the case of Nixon in China, that image at the end of Madame Mazzari, where they're all standing there with the book at the end, at the audience showing the book at the end, how do we get to the next scene? You know, I mean, it's all these things. So, so I make all these decisions before I even get to see the singers. Yeah. I was but, just going to ask here. Uh, you mentioned casting briefly, and you're not involved in the casting process. Um, sometimes I'll say, Richard, if it's somebody we've worked with before, like in the case of Nixon, I said, call Sean Anderson now, see if he wants to do it and see if he's available, because he has the acting intelligence and the musical intelligence and the voice to sing it. Mm-hmm. I don't go to auditions because I don't live there. It's, it's, you know, it's an expense for me to fly up there, and then I really it's hard for me to be away for a long period of time. So Richard, because he goes to our New York auditions, and if he has a question on somebody, he won't show me a video. He'll just play me, like when we did um, uh, Flying Dutchman. We did Flying Dutchman. There were three or four people for Zenta's father, and he played the different recordings. And I said, well, if you ask me just based purely on what I heard, I preferred this person. And that's who he preferred, so that's what we went with. That was Richard Bernstein. But, but oftentimes I feel like the conductor is the one who is in the performance. So he has to be comfortable with who's singing the parts. 
I can recommend somebody, but he has to ultimately make that decision. Mm -hmm. But you are ultimately saying that casting in an opera is crucial. Oh, yes. I mean, absolutely. You have to have the right person. I mean, if it's a small part and it's not quite the right person, you can make that work. But if it's a major part and they're not the right person, I mean, I can do it. I teach for a living, so I can, you know, I can guide somebody if they're not capable or not ready to go somewhere or haven't ever done, haven't ever acted or portrayed something like that. But it's a lot easier if, if the cast gets along, number one. If they get along, that's that's a big part of it. And if they're good colleagues, that's another part of it. So Absolutely. Now you described all the details that you first put in place before the singers come. Now let's continue. The singers have arrived. How do you proceed then? First of all, I may know some of them. I may not know some of them. So I introduce myself. And then we do a musical rehearsal. And I listen to the kinds of things that they're doing while they're singing it. Because that informs me a little bit about some of the character choices they might be making. I don't want them to be my puppet where I just put them on the stage and I say, raise your arm 45 degrees and turn two degrees to the left and say this. Um, these are real people and I have to go. So even if I have the best idea, but it's not going to work on that body or that person for whatever reason, then I have to come up with another idea. It can't be just it's my way or the highway. It can't be that way. Yeah. Um, even if, when we did Nixon, the singers asked, well, how much of those projections are going to inform how we have to play the scene? I said, well, we've left some of the moments, especially the arias, very open-ended so we can see what kinds of ideas we come up with so that I can tell the designer that these are the kinds of images we want to do to support the story you're telling. I didn't want them to have to do something that either they didn't understand or weren't comfortable with. So that, that part of it's very much a collaboration. And then You go away, you watch it, you say that scene doesn't work, and then you go back and you reread the libretto. And you think of, okay, why doesn't that scene work? And then you go back and you ask the singer, you know, I had a thought about this. Maybe we should try it this way. I think this might be a stronger choice. So, you know, it, it's, it's that constant delving in. And then at a certain point, the show has to stay where it is. Now, in the case of Nixon, we were able to change things um, because we were doing a lot of projections, we would, Johnny and I would watch and say, you know, that image isn't quite right. And then we would brainstorm with Norman about maybe it should be this image, and then we would change something. How much time would you say you spend uh, on discussing the libretto? And let me just quickly mention here for the audience or our listeners that the term libretto refers to the text of a musical work, or in this case, an opera. How much time would you say of the entire rehearsal do you spend on discussing that text? With the singers? Mm -hmm. Um, I would say 40, 40 to 50 percent of the time. It's all based on what they say. I also have to choose when I'm going to do that because sometimes, especially if it's a very difficult piece, sometimes I just have to let them sing it a couple times so they get comfortable with actually, okay, that's a three bar, that's a five bar, that's a seven bar, you know. So sometimes you can't put too much information on too soon because it's a process. So I, I look for the moment where the piece really begins to take a turn, and then I go back. So I, it's initial thoughts on the libretto, then I let them do it a few times, you know what I mean? And then I go back in. Once they're a little more comfortable about where it's taking place, you know, the blocking and when to sing, and then I go back in and ask questions or have thoughts and ideas. And then how much feedback do you give them on their singing? I also read that you are a trained singer, which was a pleasant surprise for me, and it's... Uh... Mm -hmm very very helpful i can imagine um, i don't necessarily talk to them about singing unless i see they're doing something physically that's hindering them from doing if i see them struggling and they're doing something physically i might mention the fact you know if you just opened up a little bit more here you might not struggle so much with that phrase and i always say especially with a professional singer do you mind if I make an observation about your physicality in relation to your singing you know i'll ask and then most of the times they want that um, I, but I do spend a lot of time um, giving a lot of dramatic notes. And a lot of times, if you give them the right dramatic idea that they can latch on to, a lot of those tensions go away. For you, what makes a good rehearsal? Uh, people show up on time and you make progress. And sometimes they're not comfortable. Sometimes they're hard. The singers can get backed up because, you know, they're, they're frustrated with me. I'm frustrated because we can't find it. Or I think the best rehearsal is when... We, make, we always make progress towards something or when it, something isn't working and it raises a question, how do we solve that? 
Does that make sense? Absolutely. I mean, a bad rehearsal is when someone refuses to do anything you ask them to do. You know, and at that point, I, I have ways of dealing with singers like that. If they want to do what they want to do, then I just say, fine, show me what you have, and I'll make sure that whatever you're doing can work can fit into what we're doing if you don't want to try what I have. I mean, sometimes I'll just say that. If I find them resisting my direction, you know, and it doesn't happen often, but if it does, you know, the thing is, bottom line, they're up there performing it, so we either fire them and get somebody else, or I figure out a way to make it work for them. That's my job. Stephen, you teach at the University of North Carolina at the School of the Arts. In mm -hmm. 2011, you have been awarded the University of North Carolina Board of Governors Teaching Award, an award which attests to your excellence in teaching. Can you share with us what teaching means to you? <sighs> teaching is giving especially work with the way I teach with the students I work with, which are they're trained to be performers, is giving them the tools and the knowledge that they need to be able to take any opportunity that presents itself once they leave their time here. That's beautifully and that, said. And really finding, okay, this is what you do well, helping them understand what they do well, helping them to improve what they can do better, but giving them the skills, because oftentimes we're waiting for the voice to be ready. And so I give them all the tools so that when the voice is ready, they're able to go out and do it. If that makes sense. So that, and it's really all about, and each, and each student's different. You can't teach every student the same. Yes, you have to teach some of the same skills, but some students may need a little more of this or a little more of that, and you have to be able to, to roll with that, identify it, and then help them understand what they do well and what they need to work on, and yeah. not to be discouraged by the things they need to work on. This sounds very insightful and is something singers need to hear in this profession. In this sense, Stephen, what advice do you have for aspiring singers? Learn your craft. Do not be in a hurry. Do not jump to the performance. You have to do all of the steps before, which include knowing your text, being able to do it in English if it's not your native language that you're singing in. Um, study your languages, 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 study your diction, study all the tools, your musical tools that you're going to put in there so that you can be the most informed performance that you give. A lot of singers just like to jump to the singing of the piece, but if you don't do the nine or ten steps before you actually get to perform it, it's a hollow or it's not a successful uh, performance. So I, that's what I would say. And, and don't be discouraged. It takes the time that it takes. And I know it's very expensive, to do but if you really want to do it it takes the time it takes and i'll tell you richard bernstein who sings at the met who was at the princeton festival during flying dutchman i know his first teacher and he told her his first teacher i'm going to be at the met before i'm 30. that's where i want to be now this was a 17 or 16 year old kid and he made his met debut when he was 29 because he put it he all he everything he did was work towards that goal It's a lot of work. The performance is fun, but you've got to like the work and you've got to like the work more because there's more work than there is performance. Thank you for sharing this impressive story and singers out there, these encouraging words are for you. Now, I have some other questions that I wanted to ask. What was your favorite opera and what is a piece you long to direct in the future? My favorite opera. I have two favorites, La Boheme and The Marriage of Figaro. I could direct The Marriage of Figaro forever. I love that piece. I, every time I come back to it, I find something new. I use it as a teaching tool with my undergraduates and learning how to learn recitative and make characters and sing ensembles. It is perfect almost in every way. And the same thing with La Boheme. There's not a wasted note in La Boheme. Those are my two absolute favorites. And the project you'd like to do? I would love to do Berg's Wozzeck. I think that would be great. I don't know that anybody will ever do it, but I would love to do Vergas Botzek or Puccini's Turndot. Sounds like two exciting projects. Okay, at this point, let's move on to some rapid fire questions. Okay. Haydn or Scarlatti? Haydn. Violin or viola? Violin. Record player or smartphone? Record player. Bebop or cool jazz? Cool jazz. Milk chocolate or dark chocolate? Controversial, but I like milk chocolate. Fast food or seven course menu? Somewhere in the middle. <laughs> Mountain or beach? Beach. That brings me to the end of my questions. Is there anything else that you would like to share with our listeners? Go Absolutely. Ahead. So when I said Haydn or Scarlatti, 
I said Haydn because I've actually directed three Haydn operas, and I think they're delightful. Wonderful. So, Stephen, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. And You're welcome. Thank you, Eva, for thank you for including me. Of course, and we can wait to have you back to direct another opera at the Princeton Festival. Yeah, so support the Princeton Festival, even though we're not producing this time. It's very important to support arts organizations. So if you support the Princeton Festival, support them so we can come back even stronger next summer. Thank you so much for your shout out and the kind words. Now to all our listeners, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Be sure to visit our website at www.princetonfestival.org to learn more about upcoming events, as well as ways on how to support the festival. Please join us again next time for another exciting episode in our series. Thank you for listening and goodbye.